Hi and welcome back to Rock the JVM. I'm Daniel and in this video I'm going to talk some abstract stuff in Scala. We're going to talk types, type constructors, and kinds. Now this video is for the mature Scala developer. We are not looking at the basics here and some abstract thinking will be required for this one. All right. So as recommendations, as always, I'll recommend that you follow me in this video. So write some of the stuff that I write here on screen. And whenever you need to refresh your memory about these topics, just return to this video or to its written form at the blog with the link in the description. All right. Good. Let's go to our code editor. Good. So I've just created a small class here. I'm going to turn that into an object just in case we need to test anything. Most likely we will not, but I'm going to add a main method regardless as usual for most of these videos. So I'm going to talk about some type level stuff and I'm going to talk about how types are organized in Skull. So what's up with these types? The truth is that Scala's type system is very powerful, enough to confuse even some of the more advanced engineers and this video will address some of the confusions. And uh, generics in Scala are a particularly hard topic for which we've already posted some videos here uh, in the Rock the JVM channel, and uh, I'm going to attach some links here in the description. Now, the presence of generics in Scala has some important implications in how we think about types. So, types in Scala are organized into kinds, and a kind is, you can think of a kind as a type of types. Alright, now I'm going to start the abstract path of exploring kinds by looking at something really simple, such as normal types that we can normally attach to values. For example, if I define a value called a number, which is of type int, and on the right hand side I'm going to use 42, this int is a regular type that you can attach to values. This is plain and simple, a regular type, and you learn this probably one of the, mo uh, the first things you learn once you start with Scala. So types like int or string or things of that kind um, can be attached to values. I'll call them level zero types. Level zero types are the kind, so this is a kind, that includes the type int, the type string, the type person, if you define a case class called person, so if you define, for example, a case class person with a name and an age. This person type is a level zero type. That is, you can attach this person type to a value. So for example, if I define a value called Bob of type person, you can define a person on the right hand side with the name Bob and age 45 or something like that. Right? So the type person here is a level zero type. Right? I'm going to use this level zero type in relation to the other types that I'm going to discuss in this video. All right? So level zero types are the regular types that you've been using so far. Now, as our code gets more complicated, we are increasingly interested in reusing our code for many types at once. So for example, the logic of a list is identical regardless of the types of elements it contains. As such, we attach type arguments to the new type that we declare. So for example, if I define a class, let's call this linked list, and we attach a generic type argument, let's say t, and by this we mean that whatever code we write here is applicable to all values of, type, of any type t, and uh, this linked list will, ha will share the same code regardless of what type you end up using the list with. So a list of strings will act in the same way as a list of ints, for example. All right. Now, we generally call such types simply generic. So I'm going to comment here, and I'm going to quote that generic. And the term generic comes from the Java 5 term, which attached type arguments to uh, things such as lists or collections. And uh, Scala follows that, and uh, we, all, we can also attach type arguments to uh, types such as list or options or maps or things of that kind. Now, generic here means that in my terminology, I'm going to denote that as a level one type. What do I mean by that? I mentioned earlier that a level zero type can be attached to a value, but a level one type such as this cannot be attached 
on its own to a value. So let's call this a list. And on the type annotation of this value, I cannot say linked list equals something. So I cannot write it like this. This would be a compiler error, but rather I need to pass a concrete type argument to this linked list. For example, a linked list of int. Now that I've passed an int type, so a level zero type, to this linked list type, I've obtained a type that I can attach to a value. So a level one type can take type arguments of an inferior kind. So basically a level one type can take type arguments of level zero kind, all right? So takes type arguments in the level zero kind. All right, so I think you understand now the relationship between a level one type, which is generic in a level zero type, all right? So an, a higher level type will take type arguments of an inferior kind, all right? Now, look at how we attached the type linked list of int to this value that I called a list here. We used the level one type linked list and we used the level zero type argument int to create a new level zero type. So this over here, what have I done? I think I've added a shortcut, but I'm going to under underline here. So this linked list of int is a level zero type. Because as I mentioned earlier, a level zero type is something that you can attach to a value. Now, a level zero type is obtained by passing a level zero type int to a level one type that we called linked list. Now, this is one of the sections in this video where things might turn a little abstract, so brace yourselves. We used a level one type, that is a generic type linked list, and then we used a level zero type argument int to create another level zero type, that is a concrete type, a list of integers. Now, if you happen to pause the video and think about how this might work, or if this might look similar to something else that you've seen, this mechanism looks similar to a function. You take a function and then pass a value to it and then you obtain another value except in this case we work with types so we have a level one type a level zero type argument and the end result is a level zero type result for this reason these generic types that we've declared over here are also called type constructors because they can create level zero types so in this sense i want you to think about the linked list concept itself so the linked list concept itself is a type constructor because it takes a type and then returns another concrete type. Okay, this is why this linked list is a level one type because it takes an inferior type and then it obtains a type, a concrete type that you can attach to a value. Now, I understand that I'm repeating type a lot and so I would... Uh, suggest that you watch this video a little slowly because these concepts are quite abstract. All right, so this is a type constructor, a higher level type that receives another type and returns another concrete type. Cool. So this was a level one type. We're going to discuss level two and beyond. So up to this point, Scala has similar capabilities to Java 5, which was launched quite a while ago, more than 10 years ago, I think. However, the Scala type system moves a step further by allowing the definitions of generic types whose type arguments are themselves generic. So we call these higher kinded types. I'll call them level two types. And I'm going to give a concrete example in terms of one of the higher kinded type classes that we use either in CATS or SCAZ. Um, I'm going to demo level two types. So I'm going to define a class that I'm gonna call functor. And uh, we're going to discuss how functors actually work as in their actual implementation in another video, but I'm only interested in their signature. So a functor takes the type argument that I'm gonna call f, which is itself generic. And in Scala, we denote that by placing an underscore in between square brackets next to the type argument. Now, because this new type functor takes a type argument which is itself generic, that is, it's a level one type, then this functor is a level two type. So in order to use this type and attach it to a value, we need to use a real 
level one type. So I'm going to define a value, let's call this functor list as new functor with list. So notice that I'm not passing list of int, which would be a value level type, a level zero type, but rather I'm using the list type itself, which is a level one type. And so functor is brought down to a level zero type because we can attach that to a value. So I'm going to underline this again. So functor list is a level zero type. That is because we can apply a level one type as an argument to functor. And so functor will also act as a type constructor. because it takes the type argument f and it returns functor f. Okay, so this is the syntax and this is the structure that we use in Scala to define what I call level two types or higher kind of types. And Scala is permissive enough to allow even higher kind of types like level three or beyond. So for example, if I define a class called meta, and I'm going to pass a type argument f, which is generic in something that is itself generic. So this is valid Scala code. This would be a level three type. Okay. And if you wanted to attach um, a type meta to a value, let's call this meta functor, you would need to pass an inferior kind like functor and uh, pass that as a type argument to meta. So for example, I would say new meta with type functor. And this would be uh, valid Scala code, and but this example is a bit contrived because we almost never need to use uh, level three types or beyond. Level two types are already pretty abstract as they are, although uh, in our CATS course, we do try to smoothen the learning curve, all right? So I think by now, or I hope by now, you've understood how types are organized in terms of their level, that is, if types can take other types as arguments. Cool, so now that you know what a type constructor is, we can expand this concept to types which can take multiple type arguments and perhaps type arguments of different kinds. So let me give some examples here. So if I define a class that I'm gonna call hash map, which takes two type arguments, K and V, what level are we at? You can pause the video and try to think about it. So hash map is at level one because it takes two level zero arguments. So if you wanted to define a value that I'm going to call an address book and uh, you instantiate a hash map, you would need to pass two level zero arguments such as string and string right? And hash map of string and string is a concrete type that you can attach to a value, all right? So hash map is a level one type constructor, which takes two level zero type arguments. Let's give another example. Let's define a class that I'm going to call composed functor. I just made that up. I will take two type arguments F, which is itself generic, and another type argument G, which is itself generic. Which level are we at? Well, we are at level two. Because we take two type one arguments. And if you wanted to attach this to a value, let's call this a composed functor. On the right hand side, you would say new composed functor. And you would need to pass two level one types such as list and option which themselves are generic, but you will not pass list of int or list of any other type because that would be a level zero type. You will need to pass list and option themselves. All right, let's give another example. This is a little bit more difficult. I'm going to define a class called formatter, which takes the type argument F, which is itself generic, and uh, another type argument that I'm gonna call T, which is not generic. Where are we at? Well, we should be at level two, but it's a bit more complicated. And I'm going to talk about type constructors and type lambdas in a future video. All right. So um, this will be with some dot, dot, dot.
Okay, we are going to discuss the actual type that the actual kind that this formatter type belongs to. However, we know that it's a type constructor because it takes a level one type argument and a level zero type argument. And so if you wanted to attach this to a value, let's call this a formatter, you would say new formatter with option and string. So the first type argument needs to be of level one and the other type argument needs to be of level zero because T is not generic itself. All right. So these examples will help you practice the concepts of type constructors. Now, why should we care? Why are these things useful? We have explored how types in Scala are organized into kinds and what type constructors are. Now, why is this important and how does this help us in real life? Now, here's the deal. When you get started with Scala, you work with normal types like int or data structures like person. Um, as you work with increasingly complex code, you start noticing patterns in your code. And ideally, you will also have more power and also some responsibility in your code to shape the future of your code base. And so you would want to abstract away some of your code by using generic types, such as generic collections. And it's really hard not to use generic. It's almost impossible not to use generic code. Now, as you become even more experienced and notice some additional subtle common functionality in your code, you start to look at higher kind of types and at libraries such as cats to manage your application logic. Now, without good understanding of Scala's type system and without this kind of classification, this progression will seem really hard. And not only that, but you'll also increasingly resist it because it will seem really abstract. But as you resist it, you place obstacles in your own growth as a software engineer and as a Scala developer. However, if you flip this around and you embrace the capability of Scala's type system, this progression will be natural to you. And not only will it be natural, but you'll actually enjoy your development and uh, abstract code will seem very easy to you, whereas for other people it might seem really hard. So this is a competitive advantage in the landscape of software engineering jobs in Scala. So there you have it, folks. I hope this was useful. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button for me and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. I'm dying for feedback, so leave your comments. I read every single one. And before the next video, go ahead and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for fresh updates on upcoming material. All right, so check out the Rock the JVM website and the blog for written versions of all these videos. And until next time, I'm Daniel, signing off. <laughs>